Let's pray together. Jesus, as we open your word, would you please come? Come, Holy Spirit, open our minds, open our hearts. Show us some great things, but more than anything, take some things down to our hearts that will draw us closer into your presence, we pray in your name. Amen. So we are in the middle of a series on the sanctuary in the Old Testament. We're looking at two overlapping messages. We've been through the message of the daily round of services, the altar of sacrifice, where you receive immediate, complete, and final forgiveness. The laver, where we immediately begin to be cleansed, rejuvenated, transformed, sanctified. God doesn't just want us to drag our guts to the second coming. He actually wants us to be healed and whole now because he wants us to experience life and he wants others to see that that life is available. The cool thing is the moment he starts the transformation, because he's good for his word and he says he'll finish what he starts, he counts it as finished, even though we're still in process, and invites us into his house where he always leaves the light on for us, guidance, direction, um, illumination, inspiration. He always leaves the table set. The meal is on anytime we need uh, sustenance and nourishment. And the conversation is going at the altar where we are whisper close to God at the Ark of the Covenant, only separated by a curtain. We can come back into intimate communion with God here and now, even though we cannot yet see him face to face. That's what the daily part of the sanctuary is. And part of that is the priest. And remember what we discovered there. The priest doesn't go from us to God to get God to try to let us come home. The priest is sent from God to us to try to get us to come home. God is totally 100% on our side and desires our company and delights in our relationship. We noted then that the other layer of meaning in the sanctuary is the round of festivals, Passover, Pentecost, trumpets, atonement, um, and the Feast of Tabernacles. We haven't actually gotten to those yet because what I suggested on those is they are going to show us how God is dealing with the sin problem, not on the individual level, saving us. That's the daily services. But the yearly uh, festivals, uh, seasons, they show us how God's going to deal with the bigger problem. And we've been looking at that larger story, the fact that there was a problem in the universe that needed to be solved before any of us were even made, much less lost. The Bible gives us some clues. It's the story about how evil began. Why is there evil in this world? If we have a good God, how come there's evil in this world? Couldn't he have gotten around it? And we've discovered, here are some of the pieces playing catch up today. God is love. Love only exists where you have freedom. If I'm, not free to, if I'm not free to not love you, I'm not free to love you. I'm just programmed. And so true love always gives freedom. Freedom allows choice, and choice is risky. And if you make a wrong choice and get executed for it, you don't have choice. Sometimes wrong choices have to be lived out and consequences revealed in real life. And that seems to be what happened. There's this highest angel, we call him Lucifer, the shining one, who the Bible says went from giving to merchandising to trading. You know, love is I give, whether you give back or not. Turning love upside down is I'll give if you give. That's called trading. It says he got into trading. He got into pride. He got lifted up on who he was. And he actually wanted God to let him into the Godhead. But God couldn't do that because he's not God. He's a created being, and if you're made, you're not God. God, by definition, has an arrow on both ends, everlasting to everlasting. As I like to put it, Lucifer didn't have an arrow on one end. He had a beginning. And if you have a beginning, you're not God. And God says, no, you can't come into the Godhead. You can't be just like me. You have your place, your position as the highest angel. And the Bible says he convinced a third of the angels to join him, and there was war in heaven. Hard to understand, war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought back, and he lost. There wasn't place in heaven. And God cast the dragon and his angels out of heaven, and he cast them to the earth. He didn't just send them out. He sent him here. And here's where we'll pick up. 
I added to this slide from last week. The fairness of God. First of all, God did not execute him for making a bad choice, but he exiled him. If you execute everyone who makes a choice you don't like, you don't have freedom. So it's as if God said, okay, but I'm not going to let the war be here. Go down to earth. But notice, God sent Lucifer to a new unprejudiced world. If there are other worlds, they've seen it all going on. It's like a jury that already knows the whole story. You don't get a fair trial. So God sent him to a new spot. He put him in a beautiful tree with tasty fruit, not an ugly tree with stinky fruit. And he put the tree in the middle of the garden, not in a canyon off in some corner. I'd have put an ugly tree with stinky fruit in a canyon in a corner because I want to stack the deck in my favor. But God is fair. He did not stack the deck in his favor against Lucifer or the other way around. He gave Lucifer a real shot at getting a hearing. But he didn't force him on us. Was it fair to humans? Yes. Limited access. He put him in a tree, a public information booth. If you want to know what he's up to, you can go talk to him, but he can't come and talk to you. And he could still be sitting in his tree, and we could still be living in Eden if we'd have just ignored him. So he wasn't forced on us. Adam and Eve had no lack. They weren't missing anything in life. They had everything they could possibly need, want, or desire. How do you sell somebody something when they already have everything? You have to make up a desire that isn't there. That's what marketing is all about, isn't it? And he was a good marketer. He marketed to a third of the angels, and he started marketing to Adam and Eve. But they had no need. God didn't put a lack in there for him to fill. And they had clear warning. Clear warning. God says, don't eat of that one tree. And I saw something just last night that I found very interesting. <clears throat> in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, we're used to this phrase, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you will surely die. And that you will surely die <clears throat> is an idiom in the Greek, or I'm mean, sorry, the idiom in the Hebrew. It's an idiom, it's a use of the word twice, literally to die you will be dying. But it's used in many different places in the Old Testament to give it punch. It's really going to happen. You're going to enter a process of dying that will leave you dead. You know what I discovered? That same idiomatic use of the Hebrew is in verse 16. The Lord commanded the, the Adam, saying, of every tree of the garden, you may freely eat. You know what it literally says? To eat, you shall be eating. So when he told them to eat of the trees, it was the same kind of oomph and emphasis as when he told them they would die if they ate of the other tree. So God not only let them have the other trees for food, he told them to eat. All but one. All but one. He gave them a clear warning. Die. But nobody had seen die yet, right? Right? If we take the biblical worldview of creation, which I believe with all my heart, there had been no death yet. So what does die mean? How do you tell your three-year-old what die means when they see, you know, the hamster upside down in the cage? How do you, how do you explain this? He's not going to wake up. We're going to put him in the ground. Won't he get cold? Won't he get hungry? Adam and Eve were incredibly intelligent, but nobody in the universe had seen die, had seen death. But God says, you're not going to like it. Just stay away from that one tree. He's going to sell you something you don't want. And I would like to argue it was even fair to the universe. Lucifer came up with what he thought was a better idea on running the universe. Let's run it by power and control instead of love and giving. Remember how I've explained it? Love is a mad scramble to the bottom to lift everybody else up. And if everybody's scrambling down to lift everybody else up, everybody's going to get lifted. Power and control, Lucifer's better idea was let's scramble to the top and rule over. Well, what would the universe look like if power and control had the power? Well, Lucifer had the idea. Again, if you kill everyone who has an idea, there's no freedom. So God made a place where the universe could see what the universe would look like if Satan took over with his new idea of power and control. 
But the good news is he quarantined it in a limited venue. God knew it would be an unmitigated disaster. But he had to let it be seen. But had he let it infect the entire universe, God would have been totally irresponsible. So when I look at the fairness of God, fairness to Lucifer doesn't stack the deck against him. Fairness to us doesn't stack the deck against us. Fairness to the universe, let choices be seen, but don't let it get out of control so the, the carnage is kept as small as possible. Because what we learn, folks, is we are incapable of improving on what God has made. The Bible says when God was done, it was very good. And then we got to the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and the snake said, we can make it even better. We can improve on what God has done if we break out of his realm and into our own. And I think we've only broken things, don't you? I don't think we've improved on what God had in the first place. So we pick up the story in Genesis 3, verse 6. The woman saw that the tree was good for food, pleasant to the eyes, a tree to be desirable to make one wise. It was a good-looking tree with good fruit. She took of its fruit and ate and gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Again, I want to repeat what I've said so many times before. No bad deeds happened at the tree. It's not wrong to eat, and the fruit wasn't bad. So what was wrong? The statement of the tree was, God, we're not going to trust you. We're going to trust this serpent, and we're going to follow him instead of you. We broke up with God and ran off with another lover. Now, what happens when that happens? By the way, that means the definition of sin is not about bad behavior. The definition of sin is about broken relationship with God that leads to bad behavior. That means the solution for sin is not fixing your bad behavior. It's reentering a relationship with God, which will lead to restored behavior. Amen? We say that every week, but we, we forget it so quickly. So by sinning, separating from God, Adam and Eve chose to make this earth Satan's laboratory. Like I say, he could still be sitting in his tree and we could be living in Eden. But we invited him in and said, okay, you make this earth your experimental place to try out power and control. And we live in that war zone. Secondly, Adam and Eve chose to become independent of God. Now what happens if you become independent from God? God is life. God says, I alone am life. There's no living being in the universe that's not alive except they are living on the life of God. He feeds our life. We are not autonomously alive. That's one of the truths of Scripture. Satan wants to say, you can do it on your own. God says, I'm sorry, I alone am life. You are not life. That's the reality of the universe. Let me give you life. But when we take off with another lover... We take off with one who promises life who cannot give us life, and we forsake the one who is life and wants to give us life. Eventually, if God honors our free choice, the Bible says you're going to die. Why? Because you've disconnected from life. The wage of sin is death. You've disconnected from life. Please notice, it does not say the penalty for sin is death. I hear that all the time. The penalty for sin is death, which eventually means God kills sinners. That's your spanking. It's death. Whether it's a little sin or a big sin, whether you're a mass murderer or steal a candy bar, you're going to die. But it's not about the behavior. It's about the relationship. God doesn't kill sinners. Sin is killing us. God doesn't say serve me or die. He says you're dying. Serve me and live. Death is the intrinsic result. Is it imposed or intrinsic? When you run a stop sign, the judge imposes a fine. When you step off a tall building and smash on the bottom, no judge has to impose the results. It's intrinsic, right? And I don't believe that God imposes punishment on sinners. I believe sin in that it is primarily disconnecting from God who is life, therefore intrinsically and naturally results in a loss of life because you've unplugged from life and plugged into a dead circuit. I was on the, trying to power wash the roof on the, north side of the fellowship hall yesterday and I got up there and I screwed the hose into the uh, spigot. There's one up on the roof and there was no water. 
I went downstairs and turned the handle and discovered the handle was broken. Then I went over to the plug that's on the roof and I plugged in my power washer and it was a dead plug. There's no power there. I had to get a hose and string it from down below. I had to get an extension cord and string it from, the, you know, inside the fellowship hall because it was a dead plug. If you unplug from God, who's the live plug, and you plug into the other side, it's a dead plug, folks. God's not punishing you. He's telling you reality. You've got to plug into life or you won't live. We are not autonomously alive. I believe the results of sin are intrinsic, not imposed. The reason we're alive today is because God is giving us life. The reason people who spit in God's face are alive today is because God is giving them life, hoping to, as he violates their free will to disconnect, by keeping them connected a little longer, hoping he can talk them into coming back home. But someday, if God truly is love and love honors choice and gives freedom, he has to finally say, I have to let you try to go it alone. And the moment he does, we go out. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Just picture Adam and Eve. Suddenly, they've eaten this fruit. There's a sense of euphoria. And then all of a sudden, there's a sense of shame. Had anybody shamed them? No. You know, we live in a world today that suggests that the only reason people feel shame is because they're being shamed. Somebody believes what they're doing is wrong. I disagree with that. We can do things that cause us shame, and we can shame other people. But if, we told, if the whole world was telling you, you were just fine, you were wonderful, you were gorgeous, you were glorious, you're still going to feel shame because shame happened before anybody shamed anybody. When we disconnect from our Father, from the life source, and start going on battery as it will, you know, it's going to run down, we're going to die. We just don't keel over immediately. The minute we disconnect, called sin, we feel incomplete. There's an incompleteness that happens because we are made to be in relationship with God. That's what we're made for. So when we unplug, something's missing, and immediately we're not quite sure what it is. But being naked ain't so fun, evidently, so get some fig leaves, paste them on. How's it working? Fig leaves just don't do so well, do they? But we made the point that immediately after sin came in, that first decision to disconnect from God, shame happened. The only way we'll ever get past shame is to get back in contact and connection and daily relationship with God. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? When we broke up with God, God came to try to talk it out, just like we do in our own relationships here. And, God's, and, and Adam says, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was what? Afraid. Had God done anything fearsome? Had he done anything to make them fear? Isn't this fascinating? They've never been shamed, but they feel shame. Nothing has ever scared them, but they feel afraid. Again, I believe an intrinsic result of being disconnected from the one who is our life. Like a child being all alone all of a sudden. There may be nothing bad after them, but they feel afraid. We're made to be in connection with our Father. I was afraid because I was naked. I was afraid because I was shamed. So I hid. Fear. Shame and fear. Intrinsic, immediate res results of sin. Then God said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded that you should not eat? And the man said, the woman you gave me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. The person that Adam had just been writing poetry about, the most gorgeous creature of all of God's creation, the final act of creation, the coup de grace of the whole thing, comes up and he is awestruck. And all of a sudden, he just throws her under the bus. It's her fault. That woman you gave me. That's a whole sight different than bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. 
it's that woman you gave me. He blames the woman, he blames God. And so what does God do? God said to the woman, well, okay, what have you done? And she said, it's not my fault, it's that serpent you made. Now remember, serpents were gorgeous. Serpents were gorgeous creatures. They were at the top of the animal chain, so to speak, in terms of intelligence and beauty. So when Eve sees a serpent, it draws her in. If we saw a snake in a tree, it repels me away, right? That serpent you made, that gorgeous serpent that was talking from eating the fruit, deceived me and I ate. I wonder, and I posed this question last week and I'm going to pose it again and I still don't have an answer. Probably never will till eternity, I'll ask the Lord. How would the history of earth been different if when God said to Adam, have you eaten of the tree? And if Adam would have said, yes, Lord, I did, it was a really stupid thing to do. And that's not the direction I want to go. I don't want to run off with a snake. I want to be with you. God, what can we do about it? Please forgive me. I wonder what the history of planet Earth would have been different. I don't think it would be the same. I think it would have been a lot better. I don't know where the cross would come in and atonement and all of that. I can't, I can't flesh that out because I don't know the story that isn't, but it would have been different. But the thing I find amazing here is Adam has no repentance. Eve has no repentance. They just blame Shame and fear lead to lashing out at everyone around you. And just that one decision to disconnect from God and the entire relational structure of planet Earth completely imploded. So the Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this, you're cursed more than all the cattle. More than every beast of the field, on your belly you'll go and you'll eat dust all the days of your life. God doesn't curse Adam, God doesn't curse Eve, but he curses the serpent. He says, serpent, you are going to be the living legacy of the deceit of Satan. And I don't know how serpents got around before they crawled, but they didn't crawl till this point. And every ancient mythological system in it has winged serpents. Maybe that's an ancient memory, I don't know. But... Snakes were cursed to crawl. And snakes are a constant reminder of that first deception. But then, God keeps talking to the snake. He says to the snake, I'll put enmity, hostility. I'll keep the hostility going between you, snake, and the woman, pointing to Eve, and between your offspring, seed, generations, and her offspring, seed, I'm going to keep this war going for generations. But sometime down the line, he, a seed of the woman, will bruise your head, not the head of a seed of the serpent, but the serpent's head itself. Somewhere down the line, an offspring of the woman will re-engage the battle with you, serpent, and your head will be crushed. You will receive a mortal wound from which you will die, and in the process, that champion's heel will be bruised. He will limp, but he'll live. So what does God do? He doesn't beat on Adam and Eve. He doesn't punish them. They're completely unrepentant and blaming each other and him. And all he does is curse the serpent and offer them, I'll win everything back for you. If you'll put your trust back in me. God offers them everything, even though they haven't even said they're sorry. That's the love of God. That's the kind of a God we serve. And this statement is a declaration of war. We're not going to let the war end with the Nazis in control of France. We're going to form the French underground and we're going to fight and we're going to keep the war going till we win our victory, our freedom back. You understand that? A prolonged war is good news when you have just been conquered. Because you don't want to live under the boot. You know, the Vichy government said, well, let's all become good Nazis. And the underground said, no. And they appealed to Churchill. They appealed to the U.S., come and fight with us. We want to get our freedom back. God says, I'm going to keep this war going until we win the whole thing back. And it's a declaration of the gospel that a seed of the woman would come and refight the battle that we can't win 
and win it all back for us. The original sin was a breakdown in trust, a breakdown with our connection with God. We ran off with another lover. Shame and fear and blame happened automatically. But in the God we serve, he comes not with fire, but with desire. He comes bringing hope. He must win this battle by the power of love alone. Satan can use every trick in the book. All God can use is what he is, the power of love. And I believe love is the most powerful force in the universe. And God invites us back into love, which can conquer in our lives as well. Is love a strong enough force to win the battle? An interesting statement by George MacDonald from the late 1800s. Is power or love the making might of the universe? He who answers this question aright has the key to all righteous questions. I like the way he puts that. So what is the ultimate power in the universe? Is it power or is it love? Is God all powerful? That was a weak answer. Is God all-powerful? Absolutely. Is God love? Which trumps which? And I say love trumps power. Power is not in control of love. Love's in control of power. And that doesn't mean God isn't all-powerful. You know, different religions. Is God sovereign or is God love? And you have predestination. You have Arminianism and free will. You have all these arguments. I don't have a problem with both. God has all powerful, and praise the Lord, that power is completely saturated with love. He can do anything he wants to, and he'll always do what is best for his creatures. Absolute power, absolute love. Is power or love the making might of the universe? Love with power <laughs> is the making might, right? Powerful love. And a statement from Ellen White, a real short one. Only by love is love awakened. God can't hold a gun to your head and say, you know, love me or I'll shoot. And that's why we as Adventists don't preach hell like a lot of people do, because I don't believe you can get anybody into heaven by scaring the hell out of them. And that's not swearing. You can't get into heaven by trying to back out of hell. You have to turn around and reconnect the relationship with Jesus. And that'll leave hell behind, and you'll head into heaven. It's all about reversing the decision at the tree. Break up with the evil one and move back in with God. He forgives you at the altar. He cleanses you at the labor, and he leaves the light on for you and welcomes you home. Only by love is love awakened. All right, let's continue our story. Now God turns to the woman. First, he's, you remember, he spoke to Adam, who blamed the woman. He spoke to the woman, who blamed the serpent. He speaks to the serpent, then offers up to win everything back, and now he goes back to the, to the woman. And he says, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you will bring forth children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. You can look at that passage one of two ways, and I can't prove either one biblically, but I think I can by the character of God. It's either God decreeing, this is what I'm going to make happen, or it's God saying, here are the inevitable consequences of the choice you have made to move out of love into power and control. And I believe that side. That's where I stand, firmly. God says, I'll multiply your sorrow. The word would be better translated toil. It's not really a word about inflicting pain. However, toil can be painful, right? But because you have chosen to move out from under love and into power and control, because you've let the serpent out of the tree to run the world, your life is going to be multiplied with toil. I'll speed up your conception. Evidently, women didn't ovulate every month back then. Shoot, every thousand years would be fine if you lived forever. You'd still have a huge family. But because of death and disease and, all, and war and loss, God's going to speed up the, the fertility cycle. So God does some things. Literally in toil, it's the same word. In toil, you'll bring forth children. It's not talking so much about the pain of childbirth as the toil of parenting. Has anybody discovered that? Your desire will be for your husband. Have you noticed that women are the ones who hold 
the family together. If you women weren't calling us home, us men would just probably wander around. And he will rule over you. I do not believe that is God saying that's what I want. I think that's God saying that's what's going to happen. The physical strength will control. Remember, God gave Adam and Eve dominion over the rest of creation. Nowhere before sin did he give Adam dominion over Eve or Eve dominion over Adam. But once selfishness comes in, we are in a world where we're all trying to dominate the other. Whether spouse or friend or whatever, we're all trying to work our way to the top. Here's what I believe God is saying to Eve. Because of the choice you have made, you and your offspring females are going to have trouble with children and men. How true was that? I think God nailed it pretty good, didn't he, ladies? And then God said to Adam, because you have heeded the voice of your woman, literally, and have eaten of the tree which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it, curse it is the what? God didn't curse Adam, God didn't curse Eve, he cursed the serpent, and the ground is cursed. But notice he doesn't say, I curse the ground. He says the ground is cursed. That's different. And it's not for your sake, I'm sorry. If you look at that phrase, and it shows up a whole bunch of places in the Old Testament, cursed is the ground because of you. Because of the choice we've made, things changed. We shifted from a life-life to a life-death cycle. And as a result, in toil, it's the same word as toil for Eve. Eve's going to have toil in conception and toil in bringing forth children, and Adam is going to have toil in feeding the family. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it will bring forth for you, and you will eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you'll eat bread until you return to the ground, for out of the ground you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. The word ground is Adama. That's why we're called Adam. We're the red dirt people. We're made from the afar of the Adama. Notice Genesis 2, 2, verse 7. The Lord God formed Adam of the dust, the afar, of the ground, Adama, the dust, the loose stuff of the red dirt, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and Adam became a living being. So we were the loose dirt gathered up and formed into this body that God breathed into life. Now what's going to happen? Because you've chosen independence from God, because you've chosen sin, that process will be reversed. You will return to loose dust. I don't think they knew exactly what this meant at the time, but God says, you're going to die. Now let me ask you a question. Is death all bad in a world of sin? Adam lived 930 years. How would you like to live 930 years? You get to retire when you're 875. <laughs> There's too much pain. There's too much toil, right? Toil is the name of life. We have to scratch out a living constantly. I think the fact that we live shorter lives is really a blessing in a world of sin. God says, essentially, you're going to go back to the dust. He hasn't explained the resurrection yet, but we know now that he says, if you go back to dust trusting me, I want it all back, I'll raise you up and take you home. Amen? I like that. And Adam called the name of his woman, that's my literal translation, Adam called the name of his woman Eve, because she's the mother of all living Literally in the Hebrew, the word Eve is kava, life giver. It's built on the root of kai, which is a living one. That's an adjective. And it's all built into that sentence. Adam called the name of his woman kava, life giver, because she is the mother of all living ones, kai. So he's building on the word for life. How in the world did we get Eve out of that? Well, just for your excitement here. In the Greek, it gets translated over as hua. That little, um, I have shaky hands here, but that little reverse uh, 
apostrophe there is a breath mark, which in the Greek puts an, an H sound. So it's not Yua, it's Hua. But that U becomes a V as it moves over down through the centuries, and we end up with Spanish translating it Eva. You get, go from Kava to Eva, <laughs> okay? You can kind of almost hear it come through, and of course we do the silent E and make it Eve. Just That was just for your amazement. Now, verse 21. Also for Adam and his wife, or his woman, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Now this, this verse is just huge. How do you get tunics of skin? You know, if you have ham and eggs for breakfast, what does it say? The chicken was involved, but the pig was committed. If you're going to get a tunic of skin, the animal has to die. If you're going to have a tunic of wool, you shave the animal, spin the wool, make the fabric, and the lamb runs away. But if you have tunics of skin, the lamb dies. Now I want you to think about something here. God calls over a little lamb. Maybe there were bigger lambs back then, I don't know. He calls over a lamb. And of course, all is friendly, there's no fear. The lamb comes over, anticipating being petted, you know, being loved on. And that lamb comes up beside God, and all of a sudden, God's hands move quickly, and there's, the lamb slumps to the grass, and there's blood running out. What happened? I wonder if Eve lost her lunch of forbidden fruit behind the bush. And then God pulled the skin off that animal and you have guts, innards. This is ugly. This is awful. And here's a, th I have to say, a thought came last night that I've never had before. Actually, it came last, yesterday morning when I was running with Juan at 5 a.m. We were talking about this. Do you realize if we accept the biblical story of creation as true, absolutely, which I do, this is the first death ever in the universe. I want you to think about that. This is the first death ever to take place in all the annals of infinity. This is not only the first time Adam and Eve see death, this is the first time the angels of heaven saw death. This is the first time Lucifer saw death. This sent shock waves through the universe. God had always created and things were alive and healthy. This is the first time a life came to an end in the history of the universe. And I wonder what happened with Lucifer and his third of the fallen angels. Because you know, they're a bunch of selfish things just like we are. They have lost love and gone to self-centeredness. So if we argue, they argue on an exponential level. If we fight, they fight on a cosmic level. That must be one unhappy society out there with the demons. They must be, they'd kill each other if they could. I wonder what Lucifer was thinking. He wanted to run the world, world, the universe, by power and control. And God says it will lead to death. And he finally sees death. And I wonder if for a moment he didn't think, what have I done? And I wonder if some of those fallen angels didn't want to lynch him right on the spot. You lied to us. That's ugly. This isn't an improvement. Lucifer said in the tree, the serpent said in the tree, death won't leave you dead. Death will make you more godlike. And now God says, no, Adam and Eve, I'm sorry to have to put it to you this clearly, but that's death right there. That's ugly. That's death. That's bad. There's nothing good about it. But then, out of that death, God forms new clothing 
to cover their shame. And I don't think necessarily Adam and Eve understood all the ramifications of this, but this was the first sacrifice. This was the first life given up for the benefit of another. How did God do it? I don't know. You know, he stripped the skin off that animal. He's got to tan the hide, right? Got to measure Adam and Eve. Got to cut out the parts and sew it together. Here, try this on. And they try it on. Man, they feel a whole lot better covered up. Those fig leaves just didn't make it. How long did it take? Did God do it in a flash, or did he take the time so they could learn how to do it? Because under sin, their clothes are going to wear out. They'll have to do it themselves. But in this first death, I, I, I'm, I'm gratified by this. I'm, in, I'm, I'm encouraged by this. The first death death was at least a death with a purpose. There has been so much senseless death since then. But the first death was instructive. It was actually the first lesson in the plan of salvation. You feel empty. You feel naked. You feel incomplete and insecure. And that's what this death thing is, stepping away from God. And it will evidently, it, it will eventually leave you like that lamb on the ground, dead, lifeless. But for now, the death of that other can cover you and deal with the shame and the fear. There's only one way we can ever get past the shame and the fear and the blame, and that is if we understand that it's not in anything we do that will get us out of it. It's the death of another. I don't think they understood the cross yet. I don't think they understood all the ramifications. But I call this the first lesson in the plan of salvation. And there are many more. We're going to look at two more of them next week. Incredible lessons in the plan of salvation. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man, the Adam, has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever and that is a sentence which is never finished. Because the idea of immortalizing death, immortalizing sin, would be unthinkable. Again, think about it. If we now could eat of the tree of life and perpetuate our lives forever in this fallen, sinful, toiling, hurting mess, that would be hell. Death is actually a blessed sleep after enough time to decide what we want to do with God, and we get to sleep out the rest of the carnage until Jesus comes. Amen? In a world of sin, death isn't all bad. So it's as if God says, we can't have eating of the tree of life perpetuating this. We have to let death happen. We have to let the cycle occur. Now watch this. In the Hebrew, it's interesting. It literally says, lest... He is sending his hand. That's what reaching out is, is sending your hand. You sent your hand up into the tree and grabbed the orange, okay? That's the idea. You send your hand out. Like Noah sent the dove out of the ark, same word, okay? But it's in a, all four verbs, sending, taking, eating, and living, are in an incomplete tense in the Hebrew. The Hebrew really only has two tenses, complete and incomplete. So complete would be something done, so it's kind of now to past. Incomplete would be not finished yet, so it's present to future. So literally, these are all incomplete. Lest he, Adam, be sending out his hand, and he is taking from the tree of life, and he is eating, and he is living to eternity. We can't, you can't have both. You can't eat of both trees. It's not because the fruit doesn't make a good fruit salad. It's because... You can't be trusting God and not trusting God all at the same time. And we can't perpetuate sin forever. That would be hell. That would be an eternal hell. So he says, lest Adam has access to the tree of life and immortalizes this mess. And the question, or the sentence, is never finished.
I realized something again last night which was a new thought to me. I've always kind of had the feeling that if Adam ever got to the tree of life and ate one bite of that fruit, he'd be immortal. I don't believe that at all because it's all about relationship. Relationships isn't once in, always in. You know, we had a relationship for a minute and now we go on with other things. Well, that relationship falls apart. Relationships, by very nature, are ongoing things. You know, if, if, if you are in love with your spouse and you relate, you have a relationship with that spouse, and it's a great relationship, you don't keep interacting to keep her from sending you away or locking the door or changing the locks. You don't keep relating to keep them from rejecting you. You don't even think about rejection. You love the relationship, and you keep interacting because that's what relationships do. There's no fear in love. Perfect love casts out all fear. So there's no thought here of if I don't do the right things and if I don't keep eating, I'll die. You don't think if I don't keep breathing, I'll die. You only do that when you run out of air and can't get any, right? Otherwise, you just breathe and you just eat. Adam may have already eaten of the tree of life, but it's a relationship. You keep eating. What does it say about the tree of life in the new earth? Literally from the Greek, tree of life while making fruits 12 by the month. In other words, the tree of life has a new crop of fruit every month. What does that presuppose? We're going to come and eat over and over and over again. Isaiah tells us that we're going to come by month by month and week by week, Sabbath by Sabbath, I should say, to worship before God. Every month we're going to come to the tree of life. It's not that, oh, I've got to eat some more fruit or I'm going to die. It's I get to keep enjoying relationship. It's not a once eat, always eat. It's keep eating. Relationships keep going. We keep interacting. So this tree of life thing, it's not eat it once, you're never going to die. It's our acknowledgement that our life source is God. And we just keep coming back for more. And it'll never run out. And we'll live forever. And there'll be no fear of it running out. Oh, I got to get there before five tonight or I'm going to die. That's not the point at all. But the tree of life is an ongoing eating but once Adam, even if he had eaten of the tree of life, he ate of the other tree, things have changed. He broke up with God. He ran off with another. That's going to be your food now, and we can't immortalize it. So it says, the Lord God sent him out of the garden. That's the word, same word, sent, by the way, as um, he sent out his hand. <laughs> okay? The Lord sent them out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. But notice verse 24, so he drove out the man. Do you get the picture? Okay, Adam and Eve. What you've done has unleashed that, death, that lamb. And that's going to happen all through creation and to you. And that cannot be immortalized. You've made a choice. There are consequences Choices have consequences. Now, you can't be around the tree of life anymore. You've made your choice, and God is saying you need to leave the garden. But then it says he drove them out. And that's a word that means to expel, to throw out, to evict. Adam and Eve are standing around saying, we don't want to go. Right? They don't want to leave. And God says, no. You got to go. Come on. And I don't think he drove them out with a whip. It's more like the angels in Sodom who grabbed Lot and his wife and the two daughters and says, let's go. He took them out of the garden. And he placed cherubim. That's plural. There was a cherub on each end of the ark. They made up the two cherubim, and God dwelt between the cherubim. He put cherubim, not just one angel, but at least two or more with a, literally, the flaming sword. Let me find that phrase here. Yeah, my eyes won't lay on it. A turning flaming sword. The first lightsaber, folks. But it's in motion. You can't get away from it. 
God guards the garden because we must not immortalize sin. Now the good news is, in the book of Revelation, we're going to be let back in the garden in the new earth, and we're going to live forever and eat of that tree. He had to drive him out. They didn't want to go. We don't want to go, Lord. Please don't make us go. No, I'm sorry, but you have to go. And the cherubim were placed at the gate. It says he sent them out. Then it says he drove them out. It had to be. One final point for today, that phrase tree of life, it comes up three times, Genesis 2, 9 and 3, 22 and 24. That's it in the Old Testament. Doesn't come up again till the book of Revelation. And it's an interesting little phrase in the Hebrew. It doesn't say the tree of life. It says tree of the life. It never puts a definite article before tree, and it always puts a definite article before life. He put tree of knowledge of good and evil in the garden, and he put tree of the life. This isn't just any old life. We don't have life in ourselves. We are not autonomously alive. We have to be connected to the life. And who is that? God is the life. He's the only living one. He says, I looked around, I can't see any other. I'm it. If you're going to live, you've got to be connected to me. The tree, or tree of the life. Reminds me of my favorite New Testament passage to preach on. 1 John 5, 11 and 12, literally from the Greek. And this is the witness that the God, interesting, the God, almost all through the New, through much of the New Testament, God has the definite article. It never gets translated that the God has given us life eternal, and this, the life, is in his Son. The one while having the Son is having the life. The one while not having the Son of God, the life not is having. It reminds me of the tree of the life. It's the only place you're going to find it, folks. If we don't find life there, we won't find life at all. It is tree of the life. When we have Jesus, when we're back in a relationship with God, we have the life. Which leads me to something that I don't do a lot, and that is put up quotations from Ellen White. We as Seventh-day Adventists believe that she was a specially inspired uh, person who uh, wrote and uh, worked with the early generation of our denomination. But I want you to notice some words here. The advantages enjoyed by men of that age, speaking of the antediluvians before the flood, to gain a knowledge of God through his works have never been equaled since. And so far from being an era of religious darkness, that was an age of great light. All the world had opportunity to receive instruction from Adam, and they had a silent witness to the truth in the garden of God, which for so many centuries remained among men. At the cherubim-guarded gate, of paradise, the glory of God was revealed, and hither came the first worshipers. Here their altars were reared, and their offerings presented. It was here that Cain and Abel had brought their sacrifices, and God had condescended to communicate with them. I can't prove this biblically, but the concept, I think, has good merit. The Garden of Eden wasn't taken away immediately. It hung out on this earth until the flood, guarded by the cherubim. And we walk around saying, if God would just show himself a little more, we'd believe. No, we wouldn't. The world melted down to the point where God saw it was about to self-destruct, and he ran the rescue mission of the flood, or all would have been lost. It got down to where only one person found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and that was Noah. And let me tell you, anybody who looks into the eyes of the Lord will find grace which means Noah was the only one left on planet Earth looking. The Earth melted down to that degree with the garden present and the angels standing at the gate. Anybody could walk up at any time and see, peek in. That's what the world looked like when it was perfect, but we can't go in because there are shining angels with lightsabers. And sin took over humanity with that present. Do you see what we're getting at here? If God shows up, we'll still spit in his face unless we choose to renew relationship. 
The Garden of Eden remained on earth long after man had become an outcast from its pleasant paths. The fallen race were long permitted to gaze upon the home of the innocents, the home of innocence. Their entrance barred only by the watching angels. Notice plural, there was more than one cherubim. At the cherubim guarded gate of paradise, the divine glory was revealed. Hither came Adam and his sons to worship God. Here they renewed their vows of obedience to that law, the transgression of which had banished them from Eden. When the tide of iniquity overspread the world and the wickedness of men determined their destruction by a flood of waters, the hand that had planted Eden withdrew it from the earth. But in the final restitution, when there shall be a new heaven and a new earth, it is to be restored more gloriously adorned than at the beginning. Then they that have kept God's commandments shall breathe in immortal vigor beneath the tree of life. And through unending ages, the inhabitants of sinless worlds shall behold in that garden of delight a sample of the perfect work of God's creation, untouched by the curse of sin, a sample of what the whole world, whole earth, would have become had man but fulfilled the Creator's glorious plan. Doesn't that inspire you? Now, one more. After the entrance of sin, the heavenly husbandman transplanted the tree of life to the paradise above. But its branches hang over the wall to the lower world. Through the redemption purchased by the blood of Christ, we may still eat of its life-giving fruit. That is great writing, isn't it? The branches, it's up in heaven now, but the branches lean over the wall all the way down here. And day by day, we can come we can come back into relationship with Jesus and we can pick that fruit and eat it and we can have eternal life now. We don't have to wait. We may go through the momentary hiccup of death and be raised at the resurrection, but life begins now. We can eat of the tree now. Our sins were nailed to the new tree of life, the cross, and that cross has the fruit where we can come daily and eat. And Jesus says, if you eat me, you have life. If you have the Son, you have life. Let that picture burn into your mind. The branches coming over the wall, down here, where we can daily pick and eat. And that is life, now and forever. Let's pray. Jesus, we often think what it would be like to be in Eden and eat of that tree. Well, we're not in Eden yet, but thank you that we can eat of the tree. By coming to you and sitting at your feet day by day, reading your word, communing with you, meditating, praying, sitting at your feet, we can experience eternal life now because eternal life is simply being in relationship with you. And that's what you want, that's what you've made us for, that's what will be incomplete until we return to it. Thank you for making it absolutely, totally, immediately possible. Lord, forgive us for eating so much junk food when we could reach the fruit of the tree of life and day by day eat of its delicacies. Thank you for offering us life anew. May we take it daily and live it fully, we pray in your name. Amen.